Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, Awesome Teacher. I'm Rosalind and today I wanted to be talk I wanted to come to you to talk about uh, the top 10 things that a new SPED teacher should know. And uh, these things could be applicable to people who are not teaching in special education as well. Um, I have my notes, so I'll be referring to them. I wrote them down, so I'll be looking at them. So I'll make sure that uh, I get everything in and say what I need to say. Yeah, this Saturday, I'm back from the autism conference. It was great. Uh, later on today, I'm going to do some curriculum mapping and some uh, just doing some things. Uh, going over some notes and things that I learned at the conference. So that's what I'm going to be working on later on today. But um, as a special education teacher, we are in such a unique position because we get to empower uh, children. Well, teachers get to empower children, so we're all at a unique position, a unique advantage. But special education teachers get to work with kids who are super uh, intelligent and super underestimated, and some of them just need that extra push. So, uh, my first tip, number one, is if you are a new special education teacher, it's very, very important that you always presume comp competence. Presume competence. And this is what I mean by that. Um, my children are all, all have autism, and uh, they all have uh, severe autism. So most of them are nonverbal. They have, uh, uh, they preservate to the point where, you know, they, they don't speak, they don't talk, they make noises, they clap their hands. They just um, don't seem like they're there or they're listening. But if you assume that they're intellectually disabled or you assume that their intellectual disability will cause them not to learn or that they're so low that nothing you say is going to get to them and you just want to babysit that's not the case you have to presume competence like i teach way up and i encourage them and i uh you know i just let them know hey you can do this hey you got this oh man you everything they do like oh we're gonna write we're gonna write our name today I might have a kid who's never picked up a pencil, but we're going to write our name today. Oh, you, you can't hold the pencil. Let Miss Holmes help you. I helped them hold the pencil. Oh, look at you. You did it. This is awesome. Give them smiles, high fives, hugs. Um, we're going to sort this story. We're going to put this story in order. Um, what is the beginning of the story? Can you tell me what happened in the beginning of the story? Like, uh, who went into the woods? And, you know, they're looking at me like nobody's ever asked me a question before because they're nonverbal, so nobody talks to them. But I talk to my kids. And when they show me any inkling of the right answer, I praise them, I encourage them, I push them. And the expectations are really high because I know that they can do it. I believe that they can do it. And people just really need to believe that these kids can do it. So presume competence. Number two, uh, all behavior serves a function. So if you have a student in your classroom who is throwing chairs or hitting or biting or kicking, um, you, you said hello to him and he popped you in the face, it all serves a function. What if this child doesn't know how to say hello? So they say hello by hitting. Or what if this child says, I've had enough, I need a break. But they haven't been taught how to say I need a break. So they break something. All behavior serves a function. They're not just being bad. They're not being mischievous. It's a function to the behavior. And what I like to do is I like to take it and shape it. So if I have a student who is uh, who hits, we teach them, you know, use your words. Do you want to go to the restroom? Well, you don't have to hit. You just tell me you got to go to the restroom. Um, let's see how we're going to get you to go to the restroom. Can you sign it? Can you say it or can you show me a picture? And um, that's what we do in, in my room. We teach them appropriate behaviors or say they have to, um, 
if they if they have anxiety or they have to their coping skill is to flap or to rock or to you know just cope with this with their environment because there's so much stimuli coming in if they just have to do it provide them with appropriate time to do it you know don't just say you can't do this all day and you know that's a part of them provide them with an appropriate time to do it so all behavior serves a function number three it is okay not to know what you're doing ask for help my first year teaching I knew uh, how to write an IP goal because I had been a paraprofessional. So I read them, so I thought I knew how to write them. I also uh, knew how to do classroom management because again, my years as a paraprofessional, my years as a preschool teacher prepared me for classroom management. But there were some things I didn't know how to do. Attendance, because I had never done attendance in a public school. Um, like just a whole bunch of stuff like oh um the curriculum the texas state essential not the texas essential knowledge and skills curriculum i didn't know how to really do that like when i was um, a paraprofessional even in the state of texas the teacher looked up the teaks and told me hey we're going to be teaching this then i would go look it up so i would take disadvantage so I had to lean on my gen ed peers and thank God I had a um, teacher mentor. If you don't have a teacher mentor, find a teacher mentor. If the teacher mentor that you've been assigned to is not a good fit for you, then find somebody else. So I had, um, I leaned on my gen ed um, peers and I also leaned on my teacher mentor and I asked for help. Uh, my diagnostician helped me with the arts, with the service, schedule service pages. Um, just the ins and outs of special education but I had to ask for help I mean because people don't know what you don't know and you just don't know what you don't know and if you never ask for help you'll never get better um, number four advocate for yourself but know how to lose gracefully and then regroup quickly so it's okay to ask for help or it's okay to um, say I need this in my classroom but if you don't get it, move on. Figure out another way. Like, um, I love technology. And I really feel like my students benefit from having technology. I have computers. I have iPads. Um, I had to, um, you know, just keep requesting what I needed. And then regroup when I didn't. And then when I got it, I was, like, happy that I got it. And But I had regrouped, like, you just have to do what you have to do. You have to do what's best for your kids. You can't just have a pity party and say, "Well, it's me. I never get what I, I never get what I need." You just have to regroup because you're the bottom line is you're there to educate kids. So however you can educate kids is how you educate the kids. Um, can you teach without an iPad? Yes. Can you teach without a computer? Yes. Can you teach without the finest technology, a whiteboard? Yes. So figure out ways to do what you can do. Like I didn't have my um, whiteboard and I still don't have whiteboard. I have this like device that turns my whiteboard into a smart board, but um, we don't have the uh, Prometheans or the smart projectors yet at my campus. I went online and I figured out, I figured out a way to turn my whiteboard, you know, my dry erase board into a um, smart board using a Wii remote and a cheap IR pen. And seriously, that is how I made my um, interactive whiteboard my first year teaching. I would go and hook up that Wii remote and recalibrate it every day for when I needed it and use that IR pen and we made it do what it did. And the kids loved it. My lesson plan still went on, we rocked it. But, you know, I had to know how to lose gracefully. And it's not really losing if your campus, if you need something that your campus can't provide right then. Like I said, the next year, was it next year? Yeah, next year I got a Vimeo because my campus could provide it then. But I couldn't just say, woe is me, or oh, you can't do these lessons. No, I moved on. I regrouped. And that's what you're going to have to do as a first year teacher. You're not going to walk into a classroom. You may or may not walk into a classroom. That's perfect. 
it's not gonna be pin Pinterest perfect it's not gonna be like um, some youtubers like uh, like our classrooms we've been doing it a long time so you just walk into it and make it the best you can um, and don't spend a whole bunch of money doing a whole bunch of stuff because bottom line is you're there to educate the children and you have to use the tools that you've been given um, number five it is difficult to manage uh, paraprofessionals at first but some of your best friends will be the people who work in your classroom let me tell you paraprofessionals are wonderful um, I've had some very good paraprofessionals I've been blessed um, but everybody comes from different backgrounds everybody comes with their own life experiences everybody uh, you know it we're just all different people made up of different parts and um, when you walk into a classroom you don't necessarily like my first year I didn't pick any of my paraprofessionals I didn't hire any of them I wasn't in on their interviews or anything like that I walked into a classroom of paraprofessionals who have been with I think two or three other teachers prior to me so they knew my kids better than I knew my kids and they had already they already had pre preconceived notions of um, a teacher who teaches my population of kids because they start out it's too hard they quit so uh, my paraprofessionals just like they didn't want to form a relationship with me they didn't want to just know me they didn't want to do my plan because they were just like I know these kids I'm gonna be here long after she's gone so um, when I came in I set up my classroom so them you know this is what this is my vision um, this is what I expect can you tell me more about the kids I value your input you're important you're a part of this team um, and I just had to learn how because in school and I went through alternative certification so even even in that and I was a paraprofessional so I did have an advantage over some teachers who've never had a paraprofessional but even in all of that you don't know how to manage people if you've never managed people now I had um, well, when I was a preschool teacher, I did have paraprofessionals, but I wasn't their direct supervisor. And even at um, the school I work at now, they're just they're assigned to my classroom, but I'm not necessarily their direct supervisor. They're just in my classroom. I don't have the power to hire or fire them. So um, you have to work with them. But I said all that to say you don't know, you don't you learn pedagogy, you learn how to teach, you learn, you know skills for teaching you don't necessarily learn how to manage paraprofessionals you don't learn how to block out their schedules too what time is their lunch what time is what time are they going to be working with who what are they going to be doing with who all that stuff um, you learn by doing so um, it is difficult to manage all of that but once you get a system going and you get it smooth then it becomes easier um, you learn you know their quirks you learn you know who they are as a person you also learn who you are as a person and you also learn how to become a leader and you just take that um, and I started reading like John Maxwell books and I still do um, and I started listening to podcasts my husband got me hooked on listening to leadership podcasts because I, I want to be an effective leader and I think uh, that is a weak area working with paraprofessionals I'm also learning how to um, bone up on my strengths and not so much focus on the weak areas because um, it's just a little weakness just a small area and um, I'm gonna make it do what to do I'm gonna regroup but uh, I, some of my paraprofessionals who I've had have gone on to uh, have their own classrooms and I still keep in touch with them now we collaborate together and it's just wonderful these are some of the best people um, best friends so you know you, you just can't do your paraprofessionals dirty they're the backbone of your classroom they are a part of your team they are essential uh, and then number six lesson plan there are many special education teachers who don't lesson plan because 
they teach their IEP goals or yada, whatever, to each his own. I lesson plan, and I think the reason why I lesson plan, the reason why I value lesson planning is because I teach the standards and I implement the IEP goals. And I teach social skills and I implement the IEP goals within the social skills. So I write my IEP goals to where I can use them all day and we're not just sitting down looking at a card and saying, okay, this is your IEP goal. This is what we're going to teach. We're going to teach you to match. No, this is your IEP goal. If your IEP goal is to match, we're going to do some matching in math with numbers. We're going to do some matching um, in reading with words, with letters, with sounds. We're going to do some matching in um, science with um, animals or whatever. We're going to do... Um, matching all day we're gonna excuse me we're gonna match social skills we're gonna match <coughs> excuse me we're just gonna match all day we're gonna um you know because that's your IP goal it's not just gonna be one shot we're gonna we're gonna teach you the skill of matching across the board you're generalizing it when we go to the library I might find something that you can match in the library um, when we go to um, the cafeteria PE, um, if that's your IEP goal, to bring you up to grade level. Matching is a skill that you need to bring you up to grade level. One-on-one -on -one correspondence, if that's a skill you need to be on grade level, we're gonna do it all day. So I have to lesson plan for that. So I write my lessons. Also I write lessons so that my paraprofessionals know what to do. And if I'm ever out, my substitute knows what to do. And my paraprofessionals know what to do too. So. Uh, that's what we do. That's why I lesson plan. And I think it's very important to lesson plan. Uh, number seven, model the expectations to your students and staff. So um, I always say model, 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 model. I'm always telling my staff, model, model, model. Um, we're gonna model it. My kids are nonverbal, so I need them to learn a way to communicate. I'm gonna model communication. Uh, my kids, uh, I, I just the ex, if the expectation is that you're gonna have quiet mouth, quiet voice in the classroom, quiet voice in the hallway. I'm modeling quiet voice in the hallway. I'm modeling quiet voice in the classroom. If we're teaching social skills on the playground, I'm talking to other kids and interacting with other kids with the kid with my students. Um, I'm just modeling the expectations. If uh, if I'm if I'm like we're gonna uh, outlaw the, a certain word, we're not gonna say no today. Let's find other ways that we can tell a kid that, uh, you know, let's not do that instead of saying no. Um, I'm going to model it too. So I always say model your expectations to your students and your staff. Number eight, build, pro build positive relationships with parents and students. I cannot stress this enough. Um, my parent, my children are, like I said, they're nonverbal. They don't get to go home and tell their parents about their day most of the time. Um, and I don't know, in the state of Texas, there's been a whole bunch of legislation about um, parents have requested for cameras to be in special education classrooms. And I read uh, the legislation behind it and the parent who advocated for it and lobbied for it. And what was happening was her son was going to school and coming home with bruises and he couldn't tell his mom why he just couldn't verbalize it she would she took him out of one school put him in another school he would come home with the same with more bruises and injured so uh it made her distrust the public school system which is terrible no child should go to school and be beat and torn down emotionally physically anything like that so, uh, and parents, in light of all that negative news, when you get a parent in your classroom and they're new to you or even not new to you, until you have to earn their trust. I think if I had a special needs child who was nonverbal, those teachers would have to earn my trust um, because of the, the sensitive nature of their uh, disability that they can't advocate for themselves. 
Um, so I make it a point to every day at the end of the day, I have a communication sheet that details their entire day. I mean, it's detailed, like how many times they went to the restaurant. Uh, I mean, just detailed. What do we do for morning work? What do we do during reading? What do we do during math? Um, these are some things that you might want to, you know, talk about with your kid at home. You know, if a child displayed something to me like their mom might think their favorite color is green, well, maybe they got a new favorite color this week. I'm going to say this kid is really loving the color yellow, you know, like we picked up some yellow stuff and, you know, he finally like, he was like, I like the yellow better than the green. I'm going to tell the mom that. I'm going to tell the dad that. Um... You know, you just have to build those positive relationships. I'm always, like I have the app, it's called Seesaw. So in the middle of the day, I take pictures and um, put it on the app so the parents can see what's happening in the classroom. Videos so the parents can see what's happening in the classroom, that their children, what they're learning. Because the parents are really interested. These are, these are their kids. Like, I would want, as a parent myself, I want my teachers to communicate with me. I want to know what's going on in their lives. Like, these are their kids. And when these kids are in my room, these are my babies. And I want to tell their parents, I'm partnering with you. Hey, because I want what's best for your child, just like you do. So, um, you're part of the team, too. So, build positive relationships with the parents. I mean, that is, like, the most important thing. Like, And a lot of parents are like, when they first meet me, they don't know how to take me. And then once they get to know me, because they're like, um, Ms. Holmes, you know, you don't really have a whole bunch of expressions uh, on your face, you know, and, you know, we just don't know. And, but the kids, that like when, like when the kids come in, I'm just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I just love you so much. And, you know, um, I just want what's best for you. And we're just going to make this happen. And, um. The parents are like, oh my gosh, like when the kids come home, the parents are always saying like, you know, he did this and she did that and, you know, they've, they've never done that before and they've never just, you know, told me that they wanted it toast or showed any interest in anything or, you know, so I like for the parents to tell me too what's going on in their child's life and I tell the parents what's going on in their life. Like it's very important to build a relationship with your parents. I cannot stress that enough and with your students. I cannot stress that enough. Like those relationships go so far. Like kids will learn from you. They'll want to be in your presence. They'll want to know what you have to say. They'll value what you have to say because you value them. So building relationships is important. Number nine, collaborate with the gen ed teachers in your grade level. So oftentimes I'll go around and I'll talk to like the kindergarten teachers and find out, you know, what they're doing, how they're applying to teach. This last school year, I got a chance to observe this awesome teacher uh, in kindergarten during read aloud because I hadn't observed in a gen ed class in a while. So I got to see how she does her read aloud and I was thinking, you know, I want to do my read aloud similar to that so that when my kids so my kids are in my classroom to learn communication, academic, and social skills. So um, once they leave my setting, they go to a different setting. So I have to prepare my students for the next setting. Or either way, even if they stay in a program like mine all the way through, I still have to prepare them for their next setting. So I collaborate with other special education teachers in the next settings. And I also collaborate with Gen Ed so that I can give my kids the best access to the general education curriculum that they can get. Um, so I do a lot of, like I sat in with first grade um, on their planning to see how they plan and how they're taking their assessments. And, you know, um, and then I just talk to them like in the break room or we just, you know, just to hear what typical developing students are doing so that I can assess and pull back and think what can my kids be doing like their peers and how I can, how can I get them there because I want them to be social I want them to have friends I want them to get invited to birthday parties um I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to have a child who never got invited to a birthday party and it's not because nobody wanted them there it's just because they're not verbal and um, need help making friends and no one showed them how so um, 
Yeah, so if you're a special education teacher, you need to collaborate with your general education teachers. Even if you're an inclusion teacher, it's very important for you to collaborate with the general education teachers and let them know, um, you know, what it is that you need to do. And you guys share each other's vision. And everybody's there for the children. We're all teachers because we love teaching. Hopefully. So, um, collaborate with other people. Don't don't isolate yourself and then that leads me to number 10 do not isolate yourself you are not on an island if you don't know something look it up there are a ton of special education blogs Facebook pages that you can collaborate with other special education other special educators um, you can go to your gen ed peers like I go to um, uh, trainings, professional development trainings in my district. We have uh, what we call curriculum study sessions where every nine weeks we get to, they all get together and go over the curriculum. I go to those. Even though it's geared for, I mean, even though it's like gen ed curriculum, we all teach the same curriculum. In Texas, we're supposed to teach the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So, if I'm teaching the TEKS, they're teaching the TEKS, I'm going to go to the curriculum study sessions and learn what everybody else is learning and then I'm going to modify it for my babies. But um, I'm not going to isolate myself and be on an island because that's not good for me. And it's not good for you as a teacher to isolate yourself and be on an island because you teach special ed. No. Like, um, teaching special education is not like a curse or it's not... Um, like nobody understands what you're going through because I guarantee you that um, general education teachers have special education te special ed students in their classroom so we all need each other do not isolate yourself and um, you know just be on the island I'm a self-contained teacher and there's only two uh, there's there's two of us on our campus so there's um only one other self-contained teacher on my campus and we collaborate we're not on the island but there's some campuses in my district and in other districts that I know of that only have one but so how how do you so but you can't you still can't be on an island and the ways um, for you not to isolate yourself are to get on to social media and find other teachers that teach the same things you teach and collaborate that way um, to, to uh, podcasts blogs conferences um, networking like get to know people so you're not all by yourself because it, that's a lonely place like you don't want to be all by yourself so just you know put yourself out there like do what's best for your kids so that's my top 10 my um I hope you guys have a great year and I know you're gonna rock because you know how I know you know you're gonna rock because if you're watching this YouTube video you're already ahead of the game you're seeking information and you're wanting to know more about what it is that you are going that you're going to do. So, you're going to be awesome. You're going to be amazing, okay? And um you know, just do your best. Do you be your authentic self. The only person you can be better than is the person you were yesterday. So, um you know, you just got to do it. I will say bonus tip Take time for yourself because uh, teaching special education is a lot. It's paperwork intensive. You're teaching, but you're also doing a lot of paperwork. You're also uh, managing a whole bunch of like legal knowledge and just what you do for these arts and IEP meetings. And um, but you're gonna have to take time to take care of yourself. You have to do one thing a day, maybe five ten minutes. That is just solely for you. So take care of yourself. And that's all I have for you today. I see you when I see you. Thanks for watching my channel. Uh, click the like button if you like the video. Click su subscribe if you want to see more. And um, thank you. Oh, share it with others. And thank you for watching. <laughs>